Hey everyone, thanks for joining. If you haven't already checked out the previous video, definitely recommend you going through that one before you check out this one. We trained some really interesting models in that video last time, and right now we're gonna be looking at how to actually improve those models, taking into account what they actually are, and really trying to improve the performance on the task that we're looking at. So let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing we wanna do is we wanna look at normalizing our data. And so this idea is, is essentially, if your data has a really high variance, your model might have a harder time to learn from data that is very uh, kind of uh, spread out and kind of not normalized in a certain way. And so sometimes this normalization can really end up helping uh, your performance and sometimes it actually doesn't end up helping that much. Um, and so it's really important to think just this philosophy is we're trying to figure out uh, what model to get on our validation set, on our held out set, uh, that actually gives us the best model. And then we wanna figure out that and then use that to finally figure out uh, what our performance really is. So we're gonna try some normalization methods, see if it works on our validation set. And if it does, we'll go ahead and try them on. And so another more normalization uh, method that you could use is this called uh, min-max scaling. And so this is the idea that you essentially can scale all your features between zero and one. Um, you see just from this formula, you're essentially taking that the, min the minimum of that vector and subtracting that over the range of the entire vector. And that has the effect of if you were at the minimum, you'd be at zero. If you were at the maximum, you'd be one. And all your features end up being there. So it actually ends up being a really nice way to kind of uh, um, recognize these features and, and really kind of use them in ways that won't saturate. So things like sigmoid functions kind of saturate towards the end. And using min-max scaling can kind of help prevent some of these issues. So let's take a look at how to actually code these uh, certain kinds of normalization algorithms in Python. It's actually pretty easy using the same packages that we installed last time, uh, the same data set. This is actually the same start from uh, the video from last time. Um, and so we essentially just loaded in our data frame. Let's say that we looked at this variable age and we want to normalize by this age variable. Um, so we'll try the, the mean normalization first. And so the good thing about uh, uh, pandas is it's actually pretty easy to just grab the mean. Um, you just reference the column, the, the, the data frame that you're using, the column, and then you know, ask for the mean essentially. Um, and then it's also pretty easy to just, you can take a whole vector and just subtract by that one uh, uh, scalar. So you can now get a whole list of essentially saying um, the age minus the mean age. And then we're, it, we can almost be done normalizing this by the standard deviation. So we can say, And now um, these are all going to be centered around zero and have a standard deviation of one, uh, which is going to be pretty nice for some models to train uh, like we were talking about before. Um, and so we'll look at another method of normalization for min-max. And it's actually you know, very similar. If we wanted to have the minimum of this data set, what's the minimum age here? It's 29. The maximum age is 77. Uh, so we can go ahead and say uh, DF age minus age min, and this is just the same formula that we just talked about for the min-max normalization. And so this would be uh, the, the range, so this would be df age max minus df age min. So uh, yeah, so now everything it will be uh, centered between 0 and 1. And we should, if you really have a bunch of time, you're really trying to get the best algorithm you can for your given task. Uh, you should definitely try these different normalization methods and on your data and see if um, one of them actually uh, helps you on your validation set uh, that can improve your held out train testing set error. So I'm just going to briefly talk about image normalization uh, just to be, as something that you could be aware of. This is not just uh, talking about you know very tabular data. Is you can do the same sort of approaches. And essentially, uh, some of these neural networks will take into uh, into account these RGB images. So when they look at an image, they essentially three see three matrices of different RGB colors. So you have pixel intensities for each one. And so um, some researchers actually um, use you can normalize. You can for, for each each. Uh, pretty much in each channel of each image, you can normalize by the, the that channel mean over all the images. And this allows you kind of get this normalized image. Um, personally, I actually haven't had uh, success or really, it hasn't really dramatically um, improved my models, but I know for some other people that it really has uh, worked a lot for them. So I think for your models, definitely something to try, especially if you're interested in, in image data and probably talk a little bit more about this in later videos. Um, but uh, it's definitely something to, to try and not just, this is not just limited to uh, very scalar in, in numbers. It's another way to normalize things as well. So next we need to actually talk about an issue that you may not actually really think would be an issue. The, the machine and the model doesn't ever actually think about this because um, 
it's we we represented the data in a certain way that really wasn't true to what it was uh, really representing. And so uh, this data set that we had, and this is common in a lot of different data sets. The reason I'm bringing this up is because you'll have to keep be, be on the eye out for, out for this. But essentially, uh, we had so for these four different variables that you can see listed here in our data set are listed as uh, ca categorical or factor variables, um, but they're treated by the model as being one, two, three, or four as being just a linear correlation. And so the model's really not understanding that these are different types of chest pain. It's just treating some feature that's important from going from one to four and not really placing any importance. And, and for these other, um, you know, variables with, with different, there, there can be, there's, there's, not really this well-defined clear linear relationship between the zero the one and the two and they're only labeled that way because you know some humans labeled them that way and so the idea is we essentially want to make this a way that machines can actually interpret this regardless of how the human would code it and so one way to actually code these categorical variables um in in python machine learning to, to actually do these variables without having this sort of uh, uh, feature where, where you, you are you treating this as linear data when it's really a categorical data um, is you can use this uh, one hot encoding and essentially if you have some kind of very simple data set that looks like this you have some subject and some uh, type and so you try you say you have one a you have two two a so so you can make another table essentially of however many columns with however many types you have as well as however many subjects so then essentially you just have an identity uh, column for whichever one of that and then zeros everywhere else and so this will actually let you be able to train these as, as normal features and so we're going to look at applying that to the data right now as well so the first variable we're going to look at is this um, thou variable so we're going to say that pd so like everything like you should kind of be getting right now that uh, there's an easy way in pandas to kind of do all of this stuff or in scikit-learn and either one of them um, and so this idea, so we're going to take this uh, get dummies function, which allow us to just say, let's just upload the column that we know that we want to get uh, dummy variables for. Uh, if we return that, we see that we get this column um, that instead of now, because we said this get dummies, it kind of knows to now interpret this as the pretty much one hot encoding, as we just said. So now instead of saying a one, it'll it'll have this kind of format with four, four features and where one is, we'll have the one there as well. Um, and so we'll just kind of label ours, our, uh, list here just for brevity and essentially we're just going to do this for all of the uh, one hot encoding columns so I always forget that s So I've pretty much just done the exact same thing to the rest of the variables. And then what I did after was just delete the original variable in the data frame. So now what essentially we have is we have our separated, all of our, our feature problem variables that we needed to one hot encode all in separate tables. So now we need to figure out how to bring them together. Um, and so if we just look at DF right now, uh, that's just the original data frame. We also have um, our other one hot encoded uh, data frames here. Um, and so what we can do is we can do this uh, again really easy to do in, in pandas we're just going to uh, concatenate the DF uh, and so all in all the other data sets that we have so we have um, thou this one slope rest ECG and then from here we want to actually put that there's um, axis equals one and so what this one will actually what the axis equals one will do is it'll actually um, it'll allow us to it, it pretty much tells it to bind um, by the column and not by the row so if the axis axis equals zero is kind of row wise or yes is row wise and the axis equals one is column wise and since we're pretty essentially putting a bunch of, t of tables together by columns putting a bunch of columns together uh, we want to have axis equals one uh, and so we'll go ahead and just save this as a new data frame. So now that we made sure that all our data is normalized, clean, and properly formatted for our machine learning algorithms, next we actually want to take a look at these specific algorithms, understand their arguments, understand how to best tune them specifically to get the best uh, performance on our data set.
So we're gonna first take a look at SVM. And so this is not intended to be the more thorough explanation of SVM, that's a topic for another video. Uh, but we're gonna talk about the tunable parameters that you would actually need to directly apply SVM to your research and trying to figure out some ways to, from right now, the knowledge that you have right now, be able to um, gather and get the best model that you possibly can. Um, so the, the basic idea of SVM on a very high level is it kind of creates some kind of line or boundary that separates points essentially. And essentially it, it, it's uh, kind of more convenient and you'll see a lot of illustrations kind of think about it or illustrate it in two dimensions. And I'm gonna continue to illustrate in two dimensions because it, I don't really have a, a very tangible way to express this to you in, in using higher dimensions, but the really power from it, and I think it's, you should really start thinking about it as being you know very abstract. So our, our uh, data set has 21 columns now uh, with a one hot encoding, so that means 21 dimensions. So this SVM is now in this 21 dimensional space. So this is 21 dimensional abstract line that we're using to actually separate it. Um, and so just think about that, and that's kind of why it's, you know, uh, it, it'll be a pretty, a pretty uh, powerful algorithm. And so the idea is if, if we had some data like this, we wanted to figure out some way to actually classify this data. And so this is a very strange um, sort of uh, data set. And if we, if we look at it, uh, if we try to do this with just a linear line, essentially, uh, we can't, it, there's not really a good way to separate this. Uh, but if we look at something that looks like a polynomial uh, or, or something that you know has this sort of characteristic shape that looks something like this, uh, we actually can get a pretty good classification. So, and, and this idea of SVM is, is very powerful because um, you can kind of, you essentially are sort of deciding to put the shape, put the data on the shape and you kind of get to define the shape. So the default function, uh, as we looked at, was the RBF or the radial basis function. Um, that's a little bit more complicated. We're, we're going to get more into that in a second. Uh, but we're going to be focused on just two of the other common common kernels, uh, linear and polynomial. And as it turns out, it, it may end up that these these actually do perform better than the RBF on some different uh, categories. And so. Um, now that we know kind of the, this idea, basic idea of, of what these kernels are, uh, we're going to go ahead and take a look at regularization. So regularization, it's, it's really a very, very, very powerful, important concept in machine learning. And I can honestly teach a whole course about regularization, uh, definitely more than enough to fill a couple of videos. Um, and so I'm not going to go too much into detail here. Uh, but just as a broad level, when you when you see the word regularization, if you're just being introduced for it to the first time, you should really think about it's essentially this idea that you're intentionally constraining your model, or you're intentionally constraining the way that your model trains, and and you're doing that in order to uh, tackle overfitting to prevent that idea of memorizing the data set that you have. Because again, the idea is that you want to be able to perform some task on some data that you haven't trained on before, and so in this way, you're actually saying, well, to tell the model, don't don't actually directly memorize everything. Um, because we're going to penalize you essentially if you decide to memorize uh, certain, you, the, the exact training set. And so this kind of implements itself in a lot of ways. You can see this indirectly in some of the loss functions um, that you can actually add regularization terms or you can also uh, do things with training procedures that have these sort of implicit regularization effects. Um, and so there's this, uh, it's a very broad idea and, and I'm not going to talk too much about it. Um, but for a lot of these sort of models that, and especially for, for SVM and logistic regression, as we'll see, there is this term that essentially is a regularization term that essentially tunes how much you want to prevent your model from overfitting. And so this will be this one idea in, in this, in this uh, um, example, this is the C regularization term uh, for SVM. And so we can see that these from examples from scikit-learn, uh, and so this is like another SVM in two dimensional space and it tries to get this line that's, that perfectly separates these points. Uh, and so for the line of, of C equals one, without that much regularization strength, it actually is, is the, these little small points that make it non-effective kind of make the model not as good. And so it kind of overfits to those points and I think makes these points a little bit more important. Uh, but when we decide to increase the regularization effect, uh, we see that we improve the model and we're not necessarily as sensitive to outliers. And so this idea that we don't necessarily uh, train, over train our data set, we still get this idea that we can apply it to more general data. Um, and so we're definitely going to go to regularization in later videos. So definitely check out subscribe, uh, give me that like, and you can use all those things to keep in contact of uh, when I'm going to be able to do these next videos. So thanks. All right, so this is just the pretty much the exact same code that we started from last time. Uh, we're just starting from, instead of the DF, we did all of our uh, uh, pre-processing, the one hot encoding. Um, and so we put that into the DF. Uh, we separate our training test and validation sets and we're defining our SVM model. And we see uh, this is where we were last time where we didn't uh, 
choose to, to change any of these, but we're gonna go ahead and do that now. Uh, so we can go ahead and fit uh, to some training data, some uh, train and some train Y. Um, and then model score. So this is just kind of the default. Um, we need to do this val and val y. And so uh, this this validation score, so we got a 0.73 on our validation score. So we'll see if we can try to improve that by uh, changing this model a little bit up. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is let's try to maybe increase the regularization strength. So let's maybe say, I don't know, so C was the by default one. So we'll try 50. Um, we'll see how that changes the validation score. So it doesn't actually change anything. Um, let's actually keep it as C. Um, let's change, let's keep it at one, but instead of the um, RBF kernel, a kernel will be, let's try a linear kernel. Okay, so that's actually a, a lot better. So this uh, linear kernel model uh, 0.81 Let's try to increase the. And essentially, I mean, yeah, this is what what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna I'm gonna guess the different things, and I'm gonna say I'm gonna say okay, let's try the kernel with this, and let's try the regularization strength with this. Um, and there's ways so you can think about it if you're if you're like a very engineering or, or practical standpoint, you might think of do some kind of grid search. Um, but actually, it ends up being that uh, random random sampling ends up being slightly better grid search. It's like theoretical reasons. I might have that for a different video. Um, but basically, the idea is you just want to try a bunch of different parameters together uh, of your model. Just see what works out best on the validation set. And then once you've figured out what works on best on the validation set, you're ready to actually apply it to your testing set to see what your real results are. Um, and so just starting out, it looks like that uh, kernel, from what I've seen, that this is the best uh, result on the validation set is 0.81. Um, so let's, we can try the polynomial. Sometimes these might take a little bit to run. So the polynomial ends up taking a while and actually doing the min-max normalization can sometimes help or normalization and, and otherwise can sometimes help speed that up. Uh, but so I did try a different, couple different uh, methods, like I said, and I encourage you to take go over this data and, and see what you can do. And uh, but I couldn't really find a, a model that I thought would be better than just the uh, linear um, linear kernel with a regularization of one. And oh, I, sh I actually didn't mention that this degree parameter is used for the polynomial kernels. Um, so it's the degree of the poly polynomial. Um, it's actually not used for linear kernels. Um, and so we see that we have 0.81 uh, versus the validation uh, for the polynomial, uh, uh, not as much as that. And so we'll go ahead and see how that works with the um, um, origin, the testing set. So we say test. So we get 75% uh, uh, accuracy, which is actually a, a lot better than what we had done before. Um, and so I, I actually just did the original default model. I just saved that and just to compare that. Um, Uh, that was 54 percent and so uh you can see just by tuning those parameters uh, we decided to use a linear kernel instead of the rbf kernel um and by checking the regularization although we actually didn't change it from the default um actually helped us get overall a much better model so uh in that other videos we're going to go a little bit more into uh, fixing out the random forest and logistic regression models thanks thank you so much for watching if you learn anything please leave me a like a subscribe it really helped me out help the youtube deep learning algorithm to learn supervised methods and able to learn from your likes so your like can actually put my data in a different class help that youtube algorithm actually look at me better and that would really help me out uh, again thanks for leaving a like let me know if there's anything in the comments if you want me to go over more than happy to help you can also send me a message on youtube thanks bye